What's up guys? Happy New Year! Tomorrow. Yes, not today. Uh, but I thought I'd wear my Christmas stuff because, well, it's, Christmas season isn't over until the New Year. And so this is the last day we can celebrate Christmas. Um, but hey, if you're brand new, my name is Chris. Welcome to Unite Community Church. I'm so, so glad that you are here. Um, today, what we're going to do is we're going to do a standalone message, okay? So a lot of times you come back next week, we're going to be in a whole series of talks where we kind of string together a big idea or a big thought, but today is just one singular thought. And where it came from was, well, the first snow of 2023. Now, I know you might be going, what are you talking about? Like, we still haven't gotten any snow. No, no, no. You go back, about the end of November, we had one singular snow. Right, and we, just so you know a little bit about the past six, we got a brand new dog, all right? And so sometimes this dog wants to go potty, all right? And so I take this dog out and I'm like, I have no idea if she's seen snow before, we just adopted her, right? Um, but basically, she wakes me up in the middle of the night, she has to go to the bathroom. So I get up, I go out the front door, the reason why is we got woods in the back, I don't want her chasing deer. Um, and so I'm out there, I got no pants on, I got no socks on, I have just a t-shirt on and I kind of open the door up and let her go. And I don't know what happened. This dog must have seen white and must have got so excited about the snow. I mean, it was gone. I mean, gone, right? And at that point, I'm like, my dog, my dog, right? Because here's the thing you got to know about my family, all right? We've had this dog about six months and look, we love this dog. This dog is ours. It is mine, right? If anything happened to this dog, I would never be able to forgive myself. And so this dog saw white, whoosh, gone, right? And at that point, I look down, I look up, and boom, I go after her. Next thing you know, this is literally happening in my neighborhood. Here's Pastor P and nothing but a t-shirt. No socks, no shoes, no pants, just running around going, Maisie, Maisie, get back here, get back here, get back here. Finally, she gets back, right? I scurry her in there. I come back. I'm dusting off all of the stuff, and I'm sitting there going, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. Did I just run out in my underwear? Yes. And you got to ask yourself, why would you ever have done that, right? And here's why, here's why, here's why. Because the dog is mine. Adopted, yes, but it is mine. I love that dog and I would do anything, don't miss this, clearly run around my underwear, anything for that dog to get back to me. Now, why are we talking about that? Because that dog story is our God story. And I can remember the first time that I ever realized this massive love, this huge pursuit that God had for me. I remember where I was. I remember when I understood that, and here's what's fascinating about that, is that thought about this grand picture of God, that he leaves heaven and left it all for you and me, much like I did my dog, right? It didn't come because I listened to a sermon. It didn't happen because I was on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok and, and, and you saw the super pastor do all the theatrics and make this huge theological, no, 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 it came, well, in my alone time, opening my Bible and just reading it for myself. And the question I have for you this morning, okay, as we're going to enter into the new year is simply this, is when's the last time you have read your Bible? And God has just rocked your world. When's the last time that you had a paradigm shift where, where what you read in the Bible, like yourself, spoke so deeply to you, it shifted, altered your worldview? When, heck, when was the last time you read your Bible and felt like it came to life? And here's what I'm willing to bet. It probably wasn't yesterday. It maybe wasn't this past week. And for some of us, it maybe hasn't ever happened. And because of that, listen to me, here's what I believe. I believe that I am where I am because of the Bible. I really do believe that. And so what we're going to do today is I'm going to teach our entire church how to study or read our Bibles. Because if you're anything like me growing up, 
I had great plans to read my Bible. Some of us, right, we get hyped up on church and we're like, yes, 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 I'm going to go read my Bible. And generally what happens is one of two things, okay? Number one, um, we're like, I'm going to read it from beginning to end, right? And what happens is, well, we start in the beginning, right on the left side, like a normal book, and we read Genesis. And Genesis is pretty interesting. Most people get through Genesis. You got creation, you got Adam and Eve, you got the talking snake. Um, you know, you kind of get through Abraham, some little bit of lulls there, maybe 16, 17, right? You get to Judah and Tamar. That is weird, all right? But you'll get through that. Right, and then you get into Exodus, right? And you got Moses, you got the 10 plagues, you got the 10 commandments. But then about halfway through Exodus, it starts to kind of get a little bit weird. And then by all standards, you then get into Leviticus and they are talking about law and blood and they're flinging blood and killing goats and all sorts of weird stuff. And you're like, oh my gosh. And it just kind of loses you. And then you kind of lose hope for reading your Bible, right? That's some of us. On the other side of the coin, we'll get hyped up on the Bible, or maybe we'll have a bad day, right? And we're like, all right, I, I know what to do. I know how to fix it. The Bible. But we don't know really where to go or what to do. So we play what we call uh, Bible roulette, right? Where you're just kind of like thumbing through it, bam, and open it up. And what's the verse? God, give me the verse, right? And I don't know about you, but you get to the wrong verse, and depending on the day you're having, like it could go real bad real fast. Like, for example, right, some weird verses in the Bible would imagine you're having a bad day. Imagine you just need some encouragement to know God still loves me, right? And then you get to Song of Solomon 2, verse 5. It says this, Strengthen me with raisins. Refresh me with apples, for I am faint with love. His left arm is under my head, and his right arm embraces me. Now look at, look at, look at, look at. <laughs> Depending on your day, I'm not sure that 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 is talking about what I'm supposed to do with God. You know what I mean? Like, like God just, like, it's kind of weird. It's kind of weird, right? Um, but the point is, is what happens, right? And I'll put all this together. How do we read our Bibles? A lot of us has tried from beginning to end. A lot of us has done Bible roulette where we're just pot shotting verses and trying to apply those things to our lives. But what really happens is most of the time we push back and go, well, I've tried that. Didn't work for me. I've tried to read my Bible and it didn't really apply to my life, right? And then excuse after excuse after excuse. And well, what happens is, well, the idea of reading our Bible has become a pretty faint figment of our imagination. And why I want to do this today and lead us into the new year, because I believe, I believe with all my heart, you want a better 2024 than 23, you, you want a new you in 24, then listen to me, I really do believe. When I said, I am where I am because of my relationship with God through reading his word, I, I really do believe that. I believe that this book, the Bible, has led me and has guided me that I am where I am because I make time for reading this book. And if we would decide in 2024 that I'm gonna learn to read my Bible, here's what will happen, here's the promise, is that it will change your life in a good way. Scripture puts it this way in Hebrews 4.12. It says this, for the word of God. That's this book. That's the Bible. The word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. Watch this. It judges. So, so it essentially exposes our thoughts, and our attitudes of the heart. What is this text saying? This text is saying that the Bible, the Word of God, it is living, that it is active, that it is God's voice into our lives, that it protects us, that it guides us, that it divides our thoughts, much like a surgeon where God comes into our life and with the magnet, magnitude infinite knowledge is able to tenderly scrape away sin and show our need for a savior in Jesus Christ with all the tenderness, even when you are weak. It is God's word. It is God's voice into our lives. It leads us. It guides us. What is the Bible? It guides us not into temptation, but delivers us from evil. What is the word of God? The word of God is living and active it is God's voice, God's guidance, God's spirit 
into our lives. That's what the Bible is. But the question becomes, well, how do we read it? And that's what I want to do today is just walk us through a little bit. When you walked in, you should have gotten a card. It's going to have a whole bunch of notes on that thing for you. Um, But what I want you to do is I really, really, really want you to understand how this works. And so if you're taking notes or if you look at the card in front of you, the first thing that I think, if you're going to learn how to read your Bible, the first thing you have to do, you have to find a translation you understand. Okay, and the reason for this is because the Bible was not written in English. Okay, I don't know if you realize that, all right? And the first translation of the Bible, meaning the King James Version, okay, well, it's old, right? And just like language changes, well, you got to pick a good version. For example, for example, uh, I don't know if you guys realize this, but our language has changed so much that certain words don't even mean the same things anymore. Like, I remember when I was a college pastor, okay, I did not understand that language had changed. Now, now, some language, right, stays the same, okay? Like, there's, there's some four-letter words, you know what I mean? But, 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 there are phrases that I was using that I didn't realize what I was using, right? One of the phrases was Netflix and chill, okay? Now, this is old, okay, and if you don't know what that is, that is, Essentially, hey, you want Netflix and chill? It means you want to come over and smoochy, smoochy, and then see what happens as we chill. Okay, okay. Now, I didn't know that. I just was the college pastor. I'm like old man Pasek at our college ministry at the time. And so I always heard some kids say that. Next thing you know, I'm grabbing the phone. I'm group texting another couple with my wife. And I said, hey, you guys want to come over for dinner and Netflix and chill? Man, as soon as I sent the text, my wife calls me. Hey, 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 what are you offering? And I'm like, I, I, a movie, a dinner and a movie, dinner and a movie. What's wrong? They're our friends. And she's like, that's not what that means. Idiot. Right? 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 Now, now we can laugh when that's happened in our lifetime. Okay. But, but what's funny is if you go back and look at the, well, King James version, the first English translation, well, it's confusing. And the reason a lot of us say, I don't know how, I don't understand this was because it was written in an era and a time where they talked different, right? It was, thou shalt doeth, thy saith, right? And, and you try to read this thing, and that's why in today's day and age, it's so important to pick a translation that you understand, because what is the Bible, okay? If you understand the Bible, the Bible is a book that is composed of 66 individual books, okay? It has written in three different languages, Okay, across three different continents. Okay, it's written over a 1500 year period. There's over 40 authors. Okay, and these authors are shepherds, there are doctors, there are philosophers, there's priests, there's fishermen, there's laymen, there's all sorts of different authors, right? And what the Bible is at its core, don't miss this, is that it's a collection of poems, prophecies, letters written to churches all across the Mediterranean, right? Um, the, the, it's a, got a rich history from Israel. It also has laws, it has biographies, but ultimately, what is the Bible at its core? It is God's story pointing all of us to Jesus, saying that that is what this life and this book is all about our need for a savior in the person of Jesus Christ, right? That is the big picture. That's what it's all about. And so because of that, the first thing you need to do will pick a good translation, okay? Now, if people ask me all the time, Chris, well, what are the translations you use, okay? Uh, the three translations that I use most to study with, to read through, to make that happen, all right, is I use the NIV, I use the ESV and I use the NLT, okay? Now, the reason why is because these translations are a little bit different, okay? They're very, very accurate, okay? So the people that want to argue, the Bible's not accurate, all the translations, look, look, with our technology and what we've done with language, I'm telling you, they're accurate, okay? But basically, if I could break it down, okay, the ESV is what they call a word-for-word translation, Okay, so again, if you back up, okay, you know anything about languages, okay, you learn about Spanish, okay, I'm, I'm no good at Spanish, 
Um, in fact, the only college class I ever failed was Spanish, okay? Because I can't roll my tongue. That's a whole thing. I'm tongue-tied, okay? But, but the bottom line is a lot of times they flip the verb and the noun around, okay? Does that make sense? Like that, that's Spanish, okay? They kind of flip these things. Okay, well, in Hebrew and Greek and different things like that, the languages, they have words that we, it, it takes like five or six English words to actually describe their one word. Does that make sense? So there's a language barrier, okay? And so what the ESV does, and the reason that's a little bit harder to read, is because it's a very word-for-word -word translation, okay? So if you're reading through the Bible and using ESV, that it, they're trying to get you to know the literal word-for-word -word and the flow of what's going on. Okay, so that's the ESV. There, it's very useful for that. A lot of people like that translation. It's a great translation. Okay, the one we use at UCC the most, okay, is what we call the NIV or the New International Version. Okay, and this is more of a, a thought for thought translation. Does that make sense? Like now, now it still follows the words. It still gets it all correct. Does that make sense? But but it's it's trying to use the words that they were using, but actually flow with linear common thoughts from English. Does that make sense? So if you go back to the original language, well, just like Spanish, the verb precedes the noun, okay? Like it's the same thing. They're gonna, they're gonna flip those so that we can understand it in English, okay? Um, that is that. And then the NLT, the New Living Translation, is again, it's a thought for thought translation, but this has a little bit more real life application to it. And so to me, those are the three I use. I think they're fascinating and they're great. Again, if you, if you like the new King James or you like the old school King James, look, whatever works for you, here's what I know. Pick one, pick one, pick one, pick one that you can understand. And then the second thing you need to do is you need to understand the context when you're reading your Bible. Okay, so number one, you need to pick a great translation. Okay, number two, you need to understand the context. So whenever you read the Bible, okay, you have to understand the context. Now, what I do is I use three questions to understand the context, okay? So if I'm writing a sermon, if I'm studying in my personal study, if I'm trying to grow in Christ, okay, I'm gonna ask three questions. First question is this, who wrote it? Very, very important to understand who wrote what you are reading. The second question is who was it written to, okay? So again, if you know who it's written to, it says a whole lot about what you're about to read. The third thing is what is the purpose of what you're reading? Okay, so number one, who wrote it? Number two, who is it written to? Number three, what is the purpose of the letter? And this is fascinating because if you could understand the context, right, and you can ask those questions, even the most complicated books will become quite Simple. For example, my small group, love my small group. Uh, we started our small group in the fall and we decided what we were going to do in our group was just read through the Bible. Okay. Now, now what I did, cause I never suggest start a Genesis and try to get through the whole thing. Okay. I, I don't think that's the smartest way to do it. Okay. But what I'd say, Hey, look, let's just take a book at a time. And so we kind of asked our small group, I said, all right, what book do you want to read? And the um, guy, Michael, love Michael. He was like, let's read Romans. Now again, I'm not 100% sure he knew what he was getting into because I was like, oh, wow, wow, right? Because if you're a Bible scholar, the book of Romans is known as one of the thickest theological works of art in all of the Bible, all right? And so, and so I'm going, okay, okay, we just chose the hardest book to understand, the deepest book that was pro arguably ever written, and yeah, let's read it. Right, right. But here's the thing. Here's what I love about the Bible. Don't matter where you're at, Christian, non-Christian. If you can ask him who wrote it, who was it written to, and what was the purpose of the letter, listen to me, anyone can understand the Bible if you just read it. And so what we're going to do to kind of do this, because we're going to practice what we preach, is we're going to do the same thing I did in my small group, is we're going to open to the book of Romans, Romans chapter one, verse one. All right, and this is, again, the most complicated, deepest theological book ever written, okay? Now, I just want you to say, all right, let's practice what we preach. We got a good translation. We're going to use the NIV. Number two, uh, we're going to get in the context of it, all right? So we're going to start asking ourselves these context clues as we read. Does that make sense? Okay, so Romans chapter 1, verse 1. If you're following your Bible, otherwise it'll come up on the screen. We're just going to read, okay? It says this, Paul 
a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scripture regarding his son, who, as to his earthly life as a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God and power of his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith in his name for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles, okay, who are called to belong to Christ Jesus. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now, again, this is the most complicated book in the whole Bible, right? But look, if you understand the context, you're going to understand what's being written. So based on what we read, who wrote it? Okay, right in the very beginning, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. Okay, who was it written to? Okay, well, the book is called Romans, so it was written to the Romans, okay? But very specifically, right, he's writing to the Jews that were amongst the Gentiles or basically anyone outside of the Jewish race, and they started a church, right? And again, if you just read through this, it's like, wow. And then you ask the question, well, what's the purpose of this letter, right? Well, if you read, you're going to see that Jesus is on repeat. The gospel is on repeat. Paul is talking about his lordship or, or his apostleship under the Lord Jesus Christ. Why is, what's he doing? He's saying that I'm Paul who wrote it. I'm writing it to the church in Rome, to the Romans. It was a Jewish crowd amongst the Gentiles, right? But here's why I'm writing this, because I want you, me, whether you're Jewish, whether you're a Roman, whoever you are, you desperately need Jesus. Right now, it's into that context, we now can study the Bible, read the Bible. That's what we can do. And again, what's happened, we push back, but hold on, Pastor B, like, okay, how did you know all that? Well, one, well, we read it. Okay, two, is I would highly suggest, use your phone, Google things, look things up. Again, again, we have all this information at our fingertips, use it. Right? But the big thing, I'm telling you, if you could just get this practice when you read your Bible, slow down. Slow down. Slow down. Because it's not about how much you read when you read your Bible, but it's about how much you actually understand. Right? Because uh, if you really grasp this, again, think about this. We're trying to learn how do we read our Bibles. What are we going to do? Number one, we're going to choose a great translation. Okay. Number two, we're going to understand the context. And then guess what the third point is? Okay. This is revolutionary. You guys ready? Ready? Write this down. Read it. Choose something to read and read it, which I know, I know it sounds so like, oh my gosh, ding, 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 ding. Yeah. But again, 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 don't just read the Bible from front to back. Again, there's 66 different books. Right? What I would suggest, if you want to read your Bible, I'd look internally and say, all right, what are some things I need in my life right now from God? Right? Maybe you're going through a wisdom part of your life and you just need some rich wisdom. Then I would say, well, start with the book of Proverbs and just start to read it. Maybe, maybe you just need some encouragement. Right? Like you need to know God loves you, man. I, I would say a great thing. Read through the Psalms. Pick a psalm. Maybe it's the same psalm and just read it we, every day for a week, you know, but just begin to read it. Maybe it's like one of the gospels. You want to know what's it, what's G, who's Jesus, right? Read the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Um, it's fascinating what you will find that Jesus isn't really a lot like we probably knew him to be. He was radical. He loved relentlessly, but he stood up to those that were opposed to the grace of God. I mean, read the Gospels. Uh, again, maybe, maybe you want to get deep, right? You want to learn Christian living. I would read the book of James or 1 Peter. You want to get deep, theological, who, who are the depths and the hardest parts of God. Again, read Romans. Read Romans. And while you do this, okay, again, I'm going to give you three questions to ask while you read, okay? Because again, once you understand the context, how do we study the Bible? If you're going to just start to read it, 
I'd say these are the three things that you need to ask on repeat every time you sit down and open this book. Okay, number one, what does it say about God? Why? Because the book is not about you. Believe it or not, the Bible is not a self-help book. It's a book to help us know the character of God Almighty. So number one, what's it say about God? And then number two, after that, what's it say about me? You know, what, do, all right, what am I supposed to do with it, right? And then the third question I always ask is, well, what should I do with that today? So you're going to read your Bible. I think those are three fascinating questions. Again, 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 if you come back to Romans, which is great. Again, we're just going to read this morning. We're studying our Bible, right? Right? Well, what have we learned from what we read in Romans, the first few verses? Well, what's it say about God? Okay, God had a son. His name was Jesus. Okay, he appointed Paul, the apostle, to actually spread the news about this Jesus. Okay, that, that's what's it say about God. What's Romans say about God? Okay, that's what it says. It means you have grace and peace from this relationship with God. Okay, so we get that. But then second question, what does it say about me? Well, not a whole lot. Right? And again, that's where we get frustrated with the Bible. It's like, well, it doesn't say nothing about me. Well, well, then if it doesn't, again, just keep reading. Right? Again, come back to Romans. We're just going to keep reading. Again, what's it say about God? I think it said a lot about God at this point. Let's say about you. What about your today? What do you do with that today? Not a whole lot. And so we're going to continue to read because that's what you do. We're going to read our Bible. Right? Now, this is Paul as he continues, verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is being reported all over the world. Remember, what's the context? He's writing this to the church that's in Rome, the Roman church, Romans, right? So he's going, hey, what's being reported all over the world? You guys got faith, right? Remember, this is the most complicated book in the whole Bible, right? But we, do you see the picture that's being painted? Paul's like, man, I'm hearing about you. God, whom I serve in spirit and preaching the gospel of his son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. So Paul's going, look, I wish I could come to you and preach live, but I, all you're getting is a video. You're getting my letters, you know what I mean? He says this, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to come to you, but have been prevented from doing so until now in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I have had among the other Gentiles. Watch this. I'm obligated to both Greek and non-Greek, both wise and foolish. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. Now, again, the three questions, okay, what's this say about God? Okay, again, I think Paul's talking about himself, <laughs> but saying God prevented him from going to Rome, okay? But what's this say about God? Well, not a whole lot. What's this say about you and me? Not a whole lot, okay? What he's saying, he's talking about himself. I wish I could be in Rome with you, but I can't, so I'm writing you this letter. Most complicated book. It's really confusing, right? But but what I love, right, is it, what, what Chris really taught me a whole lot yet. Well, again, what do we do? What's our discipline? Well, we're just going to keep reading. Slow and steady, keep reading. Verse 16, he says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Stop. Now, again, if you pause there, what does that say about you? What Paul is saying is like, we are not to be ashamed of the gospel. What's this say about God? Well, it says that God that brings salvation, right? The gospel is the power of God that brings salvation, right? And this, what does this say for my tomorrow or my today? Like, what am I going to do with this today? He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that saves me and brings salvation to everyone, not just you, but everyone. What's that have to do with your today? Okay, don't miss this. Everything. Why? Because listen to me, no matter where you're walking at in life, here is the call for Paul, for you and for me, for the church at Rome, and for all of us in this room, it is for us to not be ashamed of the gospel because the gospel is the power that brings salvation to whatever area you're hurting in. Oh, come on now. What that means is if you're here and you're, you're ashamed 
of your past or something you've done. Right? Maybe it's what you watched last night and you dragged your butt into church and your head's hung low because you know you watched. What's Paul say for you? Right? What's this say about God? Is that, that God has the power not to shame you, but to lift you and to bring you up, to give you freedom because this God gives you grace and peace and he can forgive you. Maybe you're here and you're an addict. What's this say about you? I'm not ashamed of the gospel because I'm an addict. In fact, I'm going to take my addictions and bring them to God because God has the power to save me and to lift me up and to snap the addiction. Do you hear what I'm saying? That's how you read your Bible and how that affects my today. Oh my gosh, if we would just read our Bibles, I'm telling you, it would have the power of the gospel in our life. We're living in a world and culture. We don't know how to stand up for the things of God. We work in environments. We go to school and people are asking us to stand up for things that go against our value system, and even against our God. You know what Paul said? What's the, what's the scripture say? Do not be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Don't be a jerk. But you do not be ashamed because people just don't know the power that is in the freedom of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't know grace and peace. And if someone doesn't know grace and peace from God, they're lost. And again, what's the context of all of Rome? It was Paul in a church in Rome, a small segment of people surrounded by a people that didn't believe in God. And he's saying that this gospel, we're not going to be ashamed of it. In fact, we're going to leverage it for the power to save not just us, but infiltrate our community. But I'm telling you, you never get that if you don't slow down and read this book for yourself. And so what we're going to do today is I'm going to invite you to read your Bible with me. Okay, and so what our church is going to do for the next several weeks is that for the month of January, we're going to all get on a Bible reading plan together. Okay, it's called 30K for 30 days. Okay, what this is, is you're going to get a 30,000 foot view of the entire New Testament. Okay, and we're all going to do this together. All right, so all you have to do is you need to scan this code with your phone. Okay, it's going to send you to the Bible app. Okay, if you don't have the app, you'll download it. It's all pretty automatic. But you're going to join in the reading plan. Our entire church is doing this. Both churches, we're all going to do this together, all right? And we're going to read through the New Testament together, okay? And then next week, okay, for our next series, I'm going to teach through everything you just read. I'm going to teach through it. And then we're going to actually talk about it the following Wednesday. It's going to be a super, super fun time. We're going to be able to communicate after you get done with your reading plan for the day. You're going to be able to go comment. You're going to say what God spoke to you. You're going to be able to type that in. I'm going to read it. You're going to read my comments. We're going to be a big community. But here's the deal. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? Because again, what I want for you in 2024, what I want for our church, is I want you to hear the voice of God. What I want for you is to be connected to the Spirit of God. What I want for you is to see the glory displayed of Jesus Christ in your life. And here's what I know. There's a guy to say for me. He said, man, I love church. Man, I love worship. I love all that. But I'm telling you, if it wasn't for my quiet time, reading my Bible, I'm not sure that I would be where I am with Jesus. And I would be able to be building my life how I am today if I didn't read this book. So with that, listen to me. I'm asking you, begging you, Jump into this with us. Read the Bible. Every day we're going to read together for 30 days. All right? That's the altar call. That's what we want for you. And I'm telling you, we're going to watch the Bible change and shape our 2024. Bow your heads and let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your word. God, I pray that, oh, that we would dig into this book. God, that as your word promises, that's living and active. It's your voice into our life, God. I pray that that would be true. I pray for those that feel intimidated by it, who feel your spirit of comfort to be invited into it. For those that maybe are negative to it or had negative experiences with it, God, I pray that your grace would abound in our lives with it. God, more than anything, God, let it be as sweet as honey. Let it be music to our ears. Let it be your voice, your spirit into our souls to grow us, grow us to discover and love who you are, Jesus, more and more and more. God, we love you. We love you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.
Hey man, hey, if you're watching online and you're not one of our locations, we invite you to jump into the Bible plan reading with us. Again, scan the code right in front of us and you will jump into it with us. And we're going to be a little community reading the Bible, commenting, talking to each other. It's going to be a wild month. It's going to be super fun. We're going to launch the series 30K for 30 days next week. And I'm going to preach on the Gospels. All right. So I love you guys. Have a good new year. See you next week in 2024.